Nikon released this model just as a new generation of smaller cameras arrived on the market, and it signaled the end of a line of cameras that dating back into the 60s. What is this camera? Let's jump into the video. The year is 1977, and this is the Nichromat FT3. It's the last consumer full-size SLR. Why is 1977 important? Well, uh, for this discussion, it's the year I graduated from high school. So uh, that's why it's important. Otherwise, uh, not a particularly important year, although it is the year that uh, Jimmy Carter was um, uh, took the oath of office and became the president. Now, the uh, Nichromat FT3 arrived at a time when the, cam the camera makers were beginning to shrink the size of their products, first led by the uh, uh, Olympus OM-1, and then followed in suit by the very popular Canon AE-1 and other camera makers. Uh, Pentax released a much smaller camera. Minolta would soon be on board later in the year or in 1977 with the X-D11. Uh, and then Nikon, even later that year, would come out with its FM which was really, I guess, a, a full manual version, a very modernized version of this uh, Nikromat FT3. Let's talk about this camera, though. The FT3 was, as I mentioned, uh, not only the last full-size consumer SLR, it was also the last of the Nikromat series, which began in the mid-1960s. There were only two cameras, actually. Uh, there was the FT, which began is the FT, I guess I should say, then followed with the FT2, and then uh, finally this camera, FT3. From what I've read, the FT3 was made only in 1977, so its shelf life uh, was very short. I should mention that the Nikromat name was the consumer uh, line uh, of, of, of its cameras. That is the non-professional uh, line of cameras. As part of this, uh, there was also the Nikromat EL, which uh, later became uh, transitioned into the Nikon EL2. The EL2 was then replaced uh, by the FE, Nikon FE, which is a much smaller camera. It was really a companion to the Nikon FM. So the FT3 is a full-frame camera, uh, not full-frame, the FT3 is a full-size camera, and uh, I have an FE for comparison, and you can see just how much uh, smaller the FE is compared with the FT3. Not that it's a bad camera, it's just a much larger camera. So it's wider, it's also taller vertically, you can see shoulder to shoulder, uh, the difference in height. And uh, weight-wise, so let's just weigh the bodies. We can get a better better idea of what, what the weight is here. Okay, so the FT3 weighs one pound, um, 11 ounces. And the Nikon FE, by comparison, weighs one pound, four ounces. And though it's only a seven ounce difference, uh, when you actually carry this camera all day, you do begin to notice a difference in weight. And now with the lens attached to it, now you're looking at a camera that's Roughly two pounds, that's 3.9 ounces, so we could say two pounds, four ounces. It's a substantial camera in terms of its size and weight. Let's take a look at, well, you know what, let's compare it real quickly with the uh, FT, with the original FT. So the original FT, it's all nearly identical, and you can see that there's really only a few... Um, Let's do it this way. There's only a couple of differences. One is um, the FT3 had a hot shoe, whereas the FT did not. In fact, it had this this sort of odd uh, flat trapezoidal uh, shape at the at the top of the prism, whereas this is um, just flat and natural. Both of them had depth of field preview levers. With the FT3, it's uh, filled with um, paint enamel paint. Um, these are the same. This used an all uh, one piece solid uh, um, film advance, whereas this has a nice very comfortable plastic tip. Um, a repeater window. This is called a repeater win window because it's for the meter and so you could view the meter um, either from waist level or uh, by uh, peering through the pentaprism. Here there are slight differences. This has an M an X that's bulb flash and electronic flash synchronization, whereas this just used a single post. 
On the bottom, the cameras are very, very similar. Rewind button, tripod socket, and here's the cover for the battery. The, bat the original battery most likely was um, a mercury cell. This just comes off. Well, nope. guess it's not coming off today, is it? Oh, there it goes. There it goes. This used, uh, I can tell from the size of this battery chamber, this used a 625, the ever popular 625 mercury cell. No longer available. However, you probably can use a hearing aid battery with a, um, with a, a, a rubber O-ring. Hearing aid batteries only last about six months, so, you know, sort of not great. This uses a more traditional, yeah, come on, open up, there we go. This uses an LR44, and you can see how uh, there's a small ring in here that restricts the size of it. So this uses either uh, LR44, S76, uh, silver oxide or lithium um, battery to power the meter. The FT3 uses single battery, which powers only the meter. Camera is otherwise all manual and requires no battery power to operate the shutter. Remember, always buy a lithium or silver oxide cell. Never buy a, an alkaline battery for your uh, camera. All right, what else do we have here? There's a small uh, magnifying window over the frame counter. That's nice to have. Uh, your strap lugs, your self-timer. What sets this camera apart from other cameras is that your shutter speed were here. Your shutter speed adjustments were here. And so here's the indicator for your shutter speed and uh, and here's the lever to help you adjust the shutter speed. This is your lens release. This is a mirror lockup. The Nikon FT3 used the new AI lenses. AI meant auto indexing. Prior to the AI system, and this is for all Nik Nikromat and Nikon cameras, I should also point out that uh, Nikon also produced a line, identical line, and they, brag they branded um, it Nikomat, N-I-K-O-M-A-T. And I remember seeing some of those cameras in Hong Kong when I was uh, working there. The pre-AI lenses required the photographer to set the minimum and maximum aperture, and you did that by aligning this slot in what they called the rabbit ears with this prong. However, in order to do that, you always had to set the lens at f 5.6 and 5.6. You mount the lens and then you would twist it one way, set your min your maximum aperture and twist it the other way to set your set your minimum minimum aperture. And the idea is you're telling the metering system what the minimum and map maximum aperture was. And so as a Nikon photographer, you would always learn to first when you remove your lenses, you would Learn to uh, remove them with the lens set at f5.6, and same when you mounted it. You'd always check to make sure it was at 5.6. It was a quick thing, but it was, you know, sort of old-fashioned if you think about it. With pre-AI lenses, these little, uh, these little rabbit ears were solid. And you'll, that's how you can tell the difference between an AI lens and a pre-AI lens. Now, uh, when Nikon came in with its new AI cameras, auto indexing cameras, uh, it, you still wanted they, they still wanted backward compatibility with all of the with all the earlier line of uh, Nikkor lenses. And so, in order to do that, there was a small button right here on the lens mount. You would press that and flip up this small tab, flip that up out of the way. Then you could use your uh, then you can mount your older lenses to your Nikon cameras or in this case, a Nikromat camera. If you're using the newer, more modern lenses, just leave that in place. So now when you mounted the camera, you no longer had to twist one way and twist the other way. It auto-indexed. So what's my story with this camera? My story is that when I was in the Air Force, after I got into, uh, after I uh, enlisted in the Air Force, I was in, uh, I was in my security police tech school training, and my brother and I, who also had enlisted with me, uh, we sometimes would, uh, in our free hour or two hours, we sometimes would wander over to the base exchange, the BX. And I recall seeing this camera on the shelf, along with the uh, Yashica um, Electro uh, 35. And both cameras I found to be very interesting, particularly the uh, this Nikromat. 
as luck would have it, I never bought it because I didn't have the money because I think we were only getting paid like $50 a month. So, and this camera even then was like $200. So who could afford a, a camera when you still had to do things like, um, I don't know, buy things. <laughs> yeah, you still had to buy like your shampoo, your toothpaste, et cetera. It's, oh, your uh, deodorant, please, deodorant. So, uh, you know, it was a good 35 years, I would say, before I finally got my hands on a FT3, and, you know, I'm glad I bought it. It's a very, very solid camera, obviously. Uh, it has no modern amenities. There's no um, ability to really fit a um, fit a, a, any kind of winder to it. And up on top, this is a fairly interesting thing, the repeater window. This is a bit like a, um, like a, a Roly, you know, that has that meter window on top. This uses the old cadmium sulfide uh, uh, metering cell, so, you know, it was a bit slow to react. Uh, this meter is dead, unfortunately. It was working before. I'm not sure exactly sure what happened. I'll probably have to open up the base plate or uh, open up the top deck and take a look. Perhaps it's a wire that's um, lost its soldering connection or got pulled loose. Who knows? I'll take a look at it, though. Inside the viewfinder, you just have a... The metering, uh, what we call the metering window um, prongs, and the meter need the meter needle simply flips back and forth. Uh, the viewfinder has a central spot with a split image, horizontally split image, uh, what they actually call it a rangefinder, uh, sur surrounded by ground glass collar on a Fresnel screen. It's a fairly simple display. Uh, there's no no other indicators. You don't have any idea of what your um, what your aperture is, so you pretty much have to guess. Uh, one thing about many Nikon lenses, it, they did not have half stops, so you could set it between the stop, but there were no actually the clicks or detentes between the uh, full stops. Uh, this lens only goes down to f16. And its maximum aperture is f2. I never bought a faster lens for this. I think I toyed with the idea, but the cost for me was always too great. And I never found that uh, f2 was uh, limiting. The f2 later became uh, an f1.8, you know, ever so slightly faster. Well, that, may, that might have been, what, half a stop? Or possibly it's really roughly the same. I doubt most people would be able to tell the difference between... Uh, a photo shot with an f1.8 and one shot with f2. Now, I know some people are going to say, oh, I can always tell the difference. The f2 is better or whatever. But for most of us uh, consumers, um, the the results aren't going to be that dramatically different. Inside the film chamber, I'm not going to open up the FT3 simply because I do have some film in here. So to pop open the back, this is a bit different. Um, most modern cameras, as you know, uh, you pulled up on the... Um, you pulled up on the uh, uh, the film rewind crank, and the back would pop open. This uses the older style lever right here. Pull that down, back pops open. As with all cameras, as with all Japanese cameras, you should replace the foam seals if they haven't already been replaced. Now I've done that here because I can tell I have a new bumper here, and uh, there's no crumbling uh, foam that's um seals that seals the camera from external light this uses a vertically traveling metal blade shutter the film runs traditionally from left to right and it's fairly simple to load film pull up on the rewind crank insert your new roll of film bring it across here tuck it into one of these slots and begin advancing your uh, film once it once it's engaged both sprockets, close the back, fire off two blanks, and you're ready to go. This is the pressure plate. It's a sprung press, pressure plate. Uh, this actually keeps the canister, your film canister, from uh, moving around while you're shooting. Always a good thing. And these are your film rails. So the idea is the pressure plate pushes the film flat against the rails. This ensures that your uh, photograph will be uh, sharp across what's known as the film plane. To rewind your film, very simple. Push in the rewind button and begin cranking. 
when it reaches the end, you'll feel it release from the uh, take-up spool. If you happen to um, uh, develop your own film at home, you can stop cranking there and leave the uh, leader out. Or if you take it to a lab, just keep cranking until it goes all the way into the uh, canister. This is a self-resetting um, frame counter. So... And here are the show slow speeds. So let's just crank and do a few, get it advanced a few times, right? And if, as you can tell, this is not a quiet camera. When it goes, when that shutter releases, you know it. So it, when I say self-resetting uh, frame counter, when you pop open the bank, when you pop open the back, you will see the frame counter go to its. Uh, safe position. I wouldn't, you can't really say zero. What it really goes to is S, which is safe, which means it's time to put in a uh, new roll of film. Remember, it always leaves two blanks at the beginning for you to get the film past the exposed part that uh, you pulled out so you can, um, so you can load the camera. This has a very large eyepiece in the back. Uh, this particular camera has a metal um, little screw-in part See, there's no lens in it. Some of the cameras have a protective lens. This does not. I believe you could get diopters to match your uh, prescription eyeglasses. So that way you can take off your eyeglasses when you're shooting a, a photograph. Of course, that always presented the problem that in which you're taking constantly taking your glasses off and putting them back on again. So a lot of people would just shoot through this. Uh, being metal, however, it did offer that opportunity to uh, scratch your um, glasses, particularly if you wear um, uh, glasses with plastic frames. However, I believe this is so sharp that some people even complain that it's scratched um, uh, glass lenses. Real quickly, the FE has a little has um, a very nice soft rubber around here. What's also slightly uh, different about the F about Nikon's camera is that it preceded the serial number with the model name. So FT and then FT3. I don't have an FT2. I think I might have it one time, uh, but I no longer have it. Um, I've cycled through a lot of cameras during the years. In any case, the FT uh, would be it'd be FT FT FT2 and then then FT3. This particular camera has a couple of wrinkles right here. So that got dinged by somebody else. I thought of maybe trying to flatten that, but of course, sometimes when you try to flatten steel, you actually end up um, making it making it look worse. So I'm probably, it doesn't impede the f um, function of the camera. So I'm just gonna uh, leave it alone for now. This is a bit old school because it uses the older um, it uses the older Nikon uh, uh, typeface. That was re replaced with a much more modern look to it. And it also lets you know that even though it was branded Nik Nikromat, this is still a Nikon product. I've never shied away from using a heavier camera because in many cases, it really provides a more stable platform. Sometimes your very lightweight cameras are more uh, difficult to hold steady, particularly when you're using slower speeds, let's say uh, 1 15th or 1 30th. I, as much as possible, I never try to handhold anything below 1 8th of a second. And, uh, and while you can, it's just not a good idea because you're probably going to get some vibration, uh, just some minor handshake. That's magnified, of course, but just some minor handshake or movement of the camera when you use those very slow shutter speeds. Can you do it? Yes. Um, should you? Probably not. I've never found the size of the camera to be a big negative. Uh, for me, I have, I would say, average size hands. They're not massive. They're not tiny. Uh, and so, you know, it, it fits well in my hands. That's all I can say. See? Fits well in my hands. And the way the camera is designed, your shutter button or your uh, index finger falls naturally right here. Your thumb is here. You know, it's easy to hold the camera like so. And uh, very easy to can Very, very simple camera to use. So if you are looking for a Nikon, a full-size Nikon camera, all manual, then check out the Nikon FT3.
There are plenty of them available on the used market, and who knows, maybe you'll find uh, someone who bought one and tucked it away and never used it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any suggestions on cameras that you would like to see me review, please let me know in the comments below.